by bit, digisexuality is coming out of the closet. Never heard of digisexuality? Digisexuality is just any time you're using technology in sex or in relationships. And it's something that we all do. That's Neil MacArthur. He's an associate professor of philosophy at the University of Manitoba and the co-author of The Rise of Digisexuality, which appeared in the Journal of Sexual and Relationship Therapy. Neil's research distinguishes between two waves of digisexuality. The first wave is the kinds of technologies that we already have and are already familiar with that connect us to a human partner, whether it's through Snapchat or Skype or whether it's meeting people online through Tinder or Bumble. And these these are already very widespread and everybody is more or less a digisexual in this first wave sense. Yet with rapid advances in robotics and artificial intelligence, Niels observed how digisexuality has emerged as a sexual identity. When we talk about digisexuals as a sexual identity, what we mean is people who are users of second wave digisexual technology, which is technology that is advanced and immersive, whether it's robots or whether it's virtual worlds and virtual reality or augmented reality. It's the kinds of technologies that we can immerse ourselves in and which potentially at least take the place of a human partner rather than simply connecting us to a human partner. Until recently, the idea that humans could forge fulfilling romantic relationships with technology was just the stuff of science fiction movies. Consider the 2013 flick Her, starring Scarlett Johansson and Joaquin Phoenix. Like, are these feelings even real? Or are they just programming? They feel real to me, Samantha. Or the 2014 film Ex Machina with Alicia Vikander. Are you attracted to me? You give me indications that you are. Well, real life has caught up with the movies. Because new technologies are now able to provide increasingly intense sexual and emotional experiences, some people now see technology as essential to their sexual identity and may not even feel the need to connect with a human partner. We're starting to see now studies about the kinds of connections people form with robot companions are are very intense and are, are very genuine. Scientifically speaking, it does something different to your brain, some of these new technologies. So to what extent is digisexuality defined by the depth of one's emotional feelings for their, their digital love object? I think that's a, that's a, a crucial part of it. I think that the, the now emotional, broadly speaking, I think that as with human partners, people uh, have a different range of emotions that they will approach their technological connections with. Some people sure. may see them as purely an outlet for physical pleasure. Others may find they form what we would call a real emotional or a love attachment. Uh, so I think there's definitely going to be a continuum there. But I think I think what what distinguishes what we would call digisexuals is that nevertheless they find their connection to their technology to be very close to the sorts of connections that we would think, you know, that we would make with human partners. I see. Do you have any idea how many people identify as digisexual and and what the demographics are? Well, we're starting to see the research. Unfortunately, this is, you know, I think a a lot of the technologies are, are so new that um, it is really hard to study people. And I I have to say the other thing we've discovered in our research, and it's not surprising, is that people um, are quite reluctant to discuss it. I think there are a lot of people who are starting to experiment with these technologies and maybe are starting to experience this sort of identification with these experiences, but they honestly are, are quite afraid of stigma. And I think that one of the real uh, things we've been trying to get across in our work is that there's nothing wrong with any of this. This is a perfectly legitimate, healthy, potentially healthy, I mean, it can be unhealthy like anything else, but it's potentially a perfectly healthy form of sexual identity. And people shouldn't, we shouldn't create a new closet, basically, for digisexuals. If we've learned anything from our history of stigmatizing people with marginal sexual identities, it's that we always realize later that we shouldn't have done that. So maybe we should just skip that right now and just accept this as something that could be normal and healthy. Can you give me some sense of, you know, what kinds of digital love objects we're talking about here? For sure. So I think people immediately think of robots. And I think when they think of robots, they think of, you know, whether it's Jude Law and AI or, you know, somebody who is some robotic entity that's going to look human. Definitely robots will be part of it. And some of them may be not humanoid at all. Virtual worlds, they're often connected to uh, haptic feedback mechanisms that give them uh, stimulation, 
while they're experiencing things in the virtual world. I'll I'll give you a word that you probably won't forget once you've heard it, which is teledildonics. Right. Teledildonics uh, is technologies that provide haptic feedback through that are controlled online. What have digisexuals told you about the appeal of having a, a virtual or technological partner as opposed to a flesh and blood human one? Well, people can have a lot of different uh, motivations. Partly it could be that they've had uh, bad experiences or they've had a history of sexual trauma and they appreciate the safety that technology brings. Uh, it could be they just have an openness or a desire for new experiences. It could be that they've been in relationships or are in relationships that they don't find satisfying or where they have partners who simply aren't interested in sexually in the same things uh, that they're interested in. So those are the kinds of things that I think turn people to technology. But from a therapeutic point of view, I mean, is it worth distinguishing between, say, someone who's erotically and emotionally attached to a sex toy, say, versus somebody who maybe is frightened of intimacy with a human, where maybe they would be happier sorting that out? Yeah, I think that, but, you know, honestly, one of the things that I think the, the sex therapy world has moved towards in the last little while is not to automatically stigmatize certain behaviors. It used to be if you were kinky, you were considered potentially, well, once upon a time, if you were gay, you were considered pathological. And right now, what they look at is, do you yourself see your behavior or your attachments as problematic? If you do, then yes, there's definitely going to be potential for a therapeutic intervention. But if you yourself are happy and are not presenting as feeling pathological, then I think that we are learning to be quite accepting. Do you have a sense of how digisexuals perceive their sexual identity in relation to other sexual minorities, like people in the LGBTQ community? Well, I think that they would feel a strong, certainly the, the ones that I've talked to would feel a strong identification with the experience of marginality and minoritization that people in those communities feel. Um, I think that it is still, you know, I don't think that we would want to compare the kinds of prejudices and so on that, that they've experienced to uh, what gays and lesbians have endured. Um, I think that, you know, they're still, they're still such a small minority, in fact, that, you know, they almost haven't had a chance to be stigmatized too much. Um, but I do think there's, there's some alarm bells that should be going off when you look at how people discuss some of these issues in the media and so on and the sort of hostility people have. And I think that, I think that people um, who identify as digisexuals are already sort of starting to feel that and starting to feel very worried about about being more public. They simply haven't be, been very public to date. And so I think it's, it's you know hard for them to experience too much stigmatization when they're still kind of stuck being secret. We've talked about the rise of sex robots on Spark before, and the issue of consent always comes up. So to what extent is that con a concern for the digisexual community? So I think there's two, there's two strands of concern you can have. One is whether we're modeling consent with these these technological objects in a way that will carry over into our relationships with humans and be really unhealthy. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other is whether these technologies themselves should somehow be able to consent to, you know, our relationship to them. The idea that we might be modeling a dangerous idea of consent is definitely worth thinking about and worth paying attention to. I think that we do need to make sure that um, we are modeling healthy consent whenever we can, and there's been attempts to do that. Whether the technologies themselves need to be consenting for their own sakes because they have some kind of autonomy, I don't think we're there yet. No. We're, and so, and so, I guess I would sort of say, watch this space. That you know, we're going to have to revisit this if if we do believe that these AIs are starting to achieve some kind of genuine autonomy. We may have to think very seriously about uh, consent issues for sure. I guess for me, there's this question of intersubjectivity. I mean, obviously, you can get sexual satisfaction from something that doesn't have a consciousness, but what does it mean to love something that can't love you back? Well, you know, I think that we already have all kinds of, I mean, people love their cars more than I understand. They love their <laughs> sports teams more than I understand. And they love their pets more than I understand. And, you know, you could say, well, pets do reciprocate, but they don't reciprocate in what we would consider, you know, a full human way. Mm -hmm. And so I think we already coexist with all kinds of one-sided relationships. So I don't think we should specifically identify these sorts of technological relationships as being automatically problematic. Again, I think that as with people's relationships to their cars or their sports teams or anything else, um, they can potentially become very unhealthy attachments. And so I think that we need to be aware that this is a this is a potential problem. But I don't think we should automatically panic and assume that there's something unhealthy about it. Right. Super interesting, Neil. Thanks so much for your insight on this. Well, thanks so much, Nora. That was a lot of fun. 
Professor Neil MacArthur is the director of the Center for Professional and Applied Ethics at the University of Manitoba and the co-author of The Rise of Digisexuality, which appeared in the journal Sexual and Relationship Therapy. I spoke to him back in January.